You can be seated. Well, which of those really important verses strikes you as the most famous? <laughs> There's packed full of stuff in there. There's so many important verses. As you think about that question, which verse is the most famous, you might flip in your Bible to this passage in Mark 8, or our ushers actually have a a few of these Mark journals left that if you just raise your hand, we'd love to give them out to anybody who'd like to follow along, take a few notes today. Um, They're ready and willing and able to hand those out to you. While you're thinking about that question about what verse might be the most famous amongst all of these, I want to ask you uh, and tell you about um, a guy named Ernie Fraze. Anybody ever heard of Ernie Fraze before? There's a reason that you probably haven't heard of him before. Um, He's a famous inventor um, of an invention that you know, but you don't know him. (laughs) Um, He had a problem one day. Uh, He and his family were having a party, and this is decades ago, and they went to open the drinks and couldn't open the drinks, so they had to use their car bumper to figure out how to pry open the the lids of these cans. And so he stewed on this problem as an engineer that he is. He stewed on this problem for a while, and in a couple weeks, he had engineered what we now know as the pop top. (laughs) Um, If you've ever cracked open anything, you've used his invention, Ernie Fraze. Now you know Ernie. Have any of you ever heard of the airplane before? (laughs) Have you heard of the Wright brothers before? We know about them, right? Um, They have something in common with Ernie, as does the inventor of the cash register, as does the inventor of the self-starting ignition, as does the inventor of the electric wheelchair or the stepladder or the parking meter, which is a little less celebratory. Not only did the airplane get invented in a certain location, but so did the airplane ejection seat, uh, appropriately. All came from inventors from Dayton, Ohio. Yes. The land of invention. (laughs) This has become a bit of a running joke. I took some of our staff to the History Museum in Carillon Park, and we learned of all the lists of inventions in Dayton. And I got to tell you, the list goes on and on. I gave you 5%. I mean, it's kind of stunning. By the end of the time, you're like, Dayton is the land of invention. Something's going on here, right? Um, So we had this running joke, you know, that, well, anything that was invented, we're like, must have come from Dayton, you know? But this is really fun. The pop top came from there. Um, What's the most famous verse in this passage? Because while you didn't know Ernie, you knew about the pop top, let's think about these verses in a similar light for a second. Shout out some of the most famous verses you think come from this particular passage. Get behind me, Satan. Satan. Yeah, (laughs) yep. Who do you say that I am? Key question in terms of the identity of Jesus Christ. Yes. You are the Messiah, the statement of the answer to that question, a revelation that took the disciples a while to come to. Yeah, what else? How about you must deny yourselves, pick up your cross, follow after me. We cite that one a fair amount in the life of the church. Any others? Yeah, lose your life to find it. Classic, right? That this truth, I was was officiating a wedding yesterday and was before this couple and sharing with them that the world will promote to you this idea that if you look out for yourself, you will be the most satisfied in life if you simply look out for your own needs. And yet Jesus has come and told this truth to us over and over again through the scriptures, that if you lose your life, you'll find it, that if you serve others, that if you love God and love others, you will find true satisfaction and a full life. It's, it's paradoxical in that fashion, but yet it seems to be true. And so to declare to this couple, you are taking on a high calling of living for the other. And that, yes, you will need to continue to to look to Jesus, to wrap your story in his. The source of strength to do that can't be from ourselves because we certainly will want to live for ourselves, won't we? And so um, this was a good calling uh, in this passage as well. Well, these are the famous verses. We could probably go on and pick out a few more phrases. These are the famous verses that really stick out to us when we cite them independently. But obviously, they are all connected in this teaching from Jesus. And I would argue that there is another verse in there that actually is the stem by which all of these other famous verses uh, shoot off of. Jesus takes an opportunity to teach the disciples because there is one particular verse that got my attention when I was reading this again. Um, It's verse 33. Uh, You can see it right there. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, was one we cited. But then it was this following part that really got my attention. You do not have... <clears throat> you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
Interesting. Before we dig too far deeply into this particular verse, I want to point out to where we are. Let's mark where we are in the book of Mark, all right? Um, We're in the middle. We're in the hinge. We're in the pivot point. In fact, if you look in your your notes uh, in here, you'll see that we're in week six of 12. We are literally in the middle of our sermon series on Mark. This is the gospel, the point in Mark's gospel where he pivots. It separates the two halves of the books pivoting from Christ as the celebrated miracle worker to Jesus as the suffering servant. This particular sermon points us to the cross. This is indeed the major theme of Mark's book in revealing who Jesus is, that he is indeed the Messiah, and then defining what is the, who is this Messiah, what has he come to do, Um, that he's here to sacrifice for humanity's sins. He is the mighty Messiah who surprisingly suffers as a ransom payment for the sins of his people. Mark steadily reveals this throughout the book to the reader, why Jesus died, and this set of verses is the pivot point. Peter's confession, as we look at what he says here, serves us well, and Jesus' responses are, both of those are fleshed out even further in Matthew, if you'd like to read another account of those, where he makes a play on words using Peter's name. Peter tells Jesus who he is, the Messiah, and then Jesus tells Peter who he is, a rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. After Peter hears of Jesus' prophecy foretelling his death, Peter rebukes Jesus. Peter is hopeful for a Messiah that will either overthrow Rome or promote Jewish nationalism. He's still not prepared to hear of this suffering Messiah who will refuse those other kinds of options that he has in mind, thus the get behind me Satan and rebuke that Jesus then gives to him. Consequently, Jesus calls Peter a different kind of rock, a stumbling block. He likens him to Satan in this interaction because the devil has similar intentions of keeping Jesus from his intended mission. The line that grabbed my attention, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns, um, really, really stems right here. And seeing Peter's misunderstanding, Jesus takes another teachable moment to go beyond the disciples by calling the crowd to him, all right? So he's had this moment with Peter where there's a real misstep that's occurred. (laughs) And instead of just lecturing Peter and, you know, one-on-one telling him what's going on, he takes the moment to gather the crowd and say, "I, I can see that I need to teach more of you and reveal to more of you what's actually happening here. Fascinating teachable moment. (laughs) He calls the crowd to him. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Well, that line has a direct through line from the one that precedes it. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns has a direct line to whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. As well as the following lines that come after it, as if, as well, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory with the holy angels. I mean, this is humbling, convicting stuff, is it not? I imagine, I try to imagine what would be running through Peter's mind at this point. I mean, he's got to be humbled. His mind must be racing. As he got it so right one second ago with Peter, you know, saying, you are the Messiah, and then gets it so wrong in the next second and being called Satan, they're likened to him. Can you imagine how your mind would just be... So, Peter's humbled, his mind's racing... In six days, Jesus is going to give him another chance, though. He's going to give James another chance, John another chance at understanding more of who he is. Jesus' statement in 9-1 where he says, Truly I tell you, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before that, that the kingdom of God has come with power really only makes sense in light of the transfiguration, which we can read about later. Um, there will be a small group of three of them who will indeed see the power of the kingdom before they taste death. They're going to see Jesus in a glorious state can be revealed to them, and then they're going to go back to the mission at hand. So in a short period of time, the disciples have heard the massive contrast between Christ's near future suffering, Christ is prophesying that he is going to die, and that he's going to die a a servant suffering death, and the contrast of that with his long-term exalted state of glory. In the first teaching, the disciples hear of his looming murder, and shortly thereafter, in the second teaching, are sent forward in their thoughts to a future where he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. 
is it not fair to have a little empathy for the disciples in their lack of understanding here? <laughs> for all they're trying to absorb. They're trying to take it all in. Do you think Jesus is God? That's the question at hand at first. And it's a question we can put before ourselves. Do you think Jesus is God? Do you believe that he's proven that he is? Do you live in light of that truth, of that conviction? Do you believe Jesus is God? The weightiness of that truth means you probably don't tell him he's wrong like Peter did. <laughs> Instead, faithfulness looks like trust for the gray in between. Jesus dying as a good thing doesn't make any sense to them, right? It doesn't seem like a good move. Similarly, Jesus ascending and leaving doesn't seem like uh, better than them having Jesus with them and walking with them as they're accustomed to, right? Eventually they get it. And maybe eventually we get it. It takes us some time, maybe even a lifetime, to see that the values and the idols of the earth are not really valuable. That the mission of God is more important than anything else. More important than our own version of what we think God should be or what he should be concerned about. More important that we find our mission in the mission of God and not the other way around. It's challenging to get our heads around these things. When God is always surprising us, he's surprising the disciples constantly in these passages, it's, it puts them off kilter. They just got to declaring that Jesus is God and now wait, God can die? <laughs> I mean, this is hard. It can take time to let the reality of truth settle in and yet this was Jesus' mission to accomplish. So we consider faithfulness in our response to these passages. We consider how we walk out the journey of, of faithfulness. Faithfulness looks like not getting out of head of Jesus. It's not that Peter is stupid. He has some knowledge of what the Messiah is promised to be. The Messiah doesn't die and hurt his mind. Could he have even understood what Jesus was planning to do? So staying close to Jesus, staying behind him, <laughs> letting him lead, that's the right move. It's a better place to be, a better route to simply knowing more. Journeying life with him keeps our eyes on him. We're dependent on him. If you need some people in your life to walk with you, of course, my door is always open. We have a bunch of people here in the Life Walk ministry who are trained to, to walk beside people, to listen, to pray together. These are good things to take advantage of here in the life of the congregation that allow us to keep our eyes on Jesus. The goal of Christian life is not to find security or self-fulfillment. And in a world that promotes other things, it's a really hard message to take in sometimes. Following Jesus is responding to a radical call to commitment. It's taking up our crosses in the way of Jesus. It holds no promises of power, of wealth, of prestige, of fame. To be first, you must be last. To be a leader, you must become a slave. To live, you must die. The king does not conquer, but instead dies. How is this good news? It does not appear attractive and does seem foolish to many. It is, however, an amazing paradigm shift that forces people to look beyond this present world. When you begin to ponder what Jesus has declared he is and what he has come to do, it creates a whole new view of the world and of eternity. Jesus' death, which looks like defeat, was actually a spiritual victory of cosmic proportions. Satan and sin and death are now defeated. The age to come has broken into human history and is now available to those who receive it. In a moment, we get a chance to come before the Lord in confession. And this passage, to me, feels much like one that's worth pondering further and confessing before God a couple different lines of thought. As we come to a time of confession and hear God's forgiveness, I, I want to put a couple questions in front of you that are basically one question, but I have this pattern of asking one and then asking like seven more. <laughs> but maybe these seven others will help you think more deeply about the one main question. Feel free to write these down or ponder them this week. The main question that I'm really getting at is, are you concerned with the mission of God? Are you concerned with the mission of God? Jesus declared to Peter, you have in mind human concerns, not the concerns of God. 
Now, he wasn't saying human concerns are bad and evil in and of themselves. We have to concern ourselves with basic things every day. It's not what he's getting at. But he's saying, are your concerns, is your mission, is your stuff more important than the things of God and the mission of God and the plan that he has for people? (laughs) Here's some other questions that kind of help flesh that out a little bit further. Do you look for God at work around you on a regular basis? Or how can you look for God at work around you on a regular basis? Peter was this stumbling block versus this rock to be built on, but later on God would restore him and allow him and others to be rocks and foundations for the early church. So we ask this question in light of that. What things are a stumbling block to living your life on mission for God? Part of this worldview change that God puts within us is the recognition that once we are his, our whole lives are mission. (laughs) It's not just when we go on a mission trip that we have a mission. We come back from encounters with God and we go, wow, I can't believe God you're using me in this way. I can't believe I get to be part of your work. What an amazing thing to be a part of. How can I, um, how can I be part of that more? God, uh, show me more invitations. I want to be on mission for you wherever I go, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing. What human concerns are actually idols? or massive distractions from living for God and his amazing mission? Are there some things that are distractions or human concerns that are indeed stumbling blocks for you to focus on the mission of God? What lies have you bought into that would lead you to a mission other than the mission of God? Are you convinced of something other, that there actually is a better mission than God's mission, that, than his plan for redeeming the world and allowing us to be a part of that as ambassadors of his? If there are some things that have kind of crept in and begun to erode your conviction for the mission of God actually being the best and most powerful thing to be a part of, then then those things you might want to put before him and ask to be unseated from your life. Do you recognize that Jesus has come to free you from concerns that don't lead anywhere and welcomed you into his family that has a mission as ambassadors of God? You are freed up, my friends. Freed up from the kind of concerns that other people might have and be focused on like this that might feel in their face, but we actually have a a chance to see a bigger picture. We have been given a foretaste of eternity, and we actually get to share with people regularly, hey, these kinds of things are not going to lead to to, to a full life. Jesus over here, he is the one that actually unlocks all of that. And you'll see that the living for him is the most satisfying, purposeful way of living. And you can be freed from the burdens that you have and the sins that you have. You can be forgiven. You can be restored to God. I mean, these are amazing things that we get to share with people, keys of the kingdom. We have a ministry of reconciliation where people can become reconnected to God, forgiven of their sins, and have their lives transformed for their good, for the good of their neighbor, and ultimately for the glory of God. That's all I've got to ponder for today. Just some lightweight stuff. But it's good to have our hearts drawn back to the mission of God. And this passage points us to a pivot point where Jesus says, here's where I'm going. (laughs) And we say, lead us to the cross, Lord. Doesn't make sense to the rest of the world, but we say, lead us to the cross. Where we will find forgiveness and life. And so where we come now is where we come to also a place of recognizing that in all of that we receive resurrection and hope. As we come to confession, let's take these things before him. Whatever God has stirred up in your mind through these last couple minutes, let's come before him in a time of confession. We'll have some quiet. You're welcome to sit or kneel. And then we'll hear from God some words of forgiveness.